Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Apoor Narayan, and, and I wanted to welcome all of you. Uh, I'm very, very thankful to the all the participants of this um, session, and I welcome all the panelists and welcome all of you watching the program. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Westland and Oxford Bookstore for hosting this. Uh, I'm not going to say much. I, I just wanted to say that uh, I sort of consciously invited uh, people on this panel who weren't um, so conversant with Hindi, uh, primarily for, for the reason of um, kind of seeing how they look at a text, at a translated text uh, uh, in English and, and look at that as an English text rather than as something that needs to be compared um, with the Hindi. Uh, and so um, uh, for the same reason, I, I would be very keen to, to hear from you, all the panelists, rather than speaking myself in this session. I've done that uh, several times over on these two books and I, I wouldn't want to speak much. I would want to hear from you uh, as much as you want to say or read. Uh, I'll just, um, Anjali Parohit will be moderating this session and uh, I'll just briefly introduce her. Uh, Anjali is a painter, writer, poet, translator and curator. She has, has two books to her credit, uh, Ragi Ragani, Chronicles from Ajay's Kitchen and Go Talk to the River, The Ovis of uh, Behna Bhai Chaudhary. She's also the founder and curator of the Cappuccino Adda, which is an initiative uh, working to foster a literary uh, cafe culture in Mumbai and contribute to building uh, a vibrant uh, writers community. I leave it to Anjali uh, to take this session forward and, and uh, to allow all the panelists to, to make the points. Thank you so much. Thank you, Apoorva. Uh, first, I will congratulate you and John for, for giving us these two really wonderful, wonderful books and, and in a way introducing us so well to the work of uh, Kuwar Narayan. Mm, I will um, not take too much time. I will just do very brief introductions because we want to listen to um, everyone who's here. Uh, so I will briefly introduce um, uh, the five uh, panelists here. Stefano Stefanides is a Cypriot-born author, poet, translator, critic, ethnographer, and documentary filmmaker. His poems have been published in more than 12 languages. His fieldwork with the descendants of Indian indentured laborers, laborers in Guyanese villages and sugar plantations gave rise to various projects, including two documentary films, Hail Mother Kali and Kali in the Americas. His latest book is The Wind Under My Lips. Shaikat Muzumdar is the author of three novels, The Scent of God, The Firebird and Silverfish, a work of nonfiction, college of literary criticism, prose of the world and co-edited collection <coughs> of essays, The Critic as Amateur. He has taught at Stanford University, was a fellow at Wellesley College and is currently professor of English and creative writing at Ashoka University. His new book, The Middle Finger will be published next year. Priya Sarukai Chabria is an award-winning poet, translator and writer of nine books of poetry, speculative fiction, literary nonfiction translation, and as editor, two poetry anthologies. Her books include Andal, the autobiography of a goddess, Sing of Life, Revisioning, Tagore's Gitanjali, Clone, which is a speculative fiction, and Bombay Mumbai, Immersions, a nonfiction. She is the founding editor of Poetry at Sangam. John Water, um, sorry, Apurva Narayan, of course, uh, the initiator of these three fabulous evenings of uh, sessions. Apurva Narayan is Kuwar Narayan's son and translator into English. His work has been published in several literary journals. His first book of translations was No Other World. He is the translator of Witnesses of Remembrance and the co-translator of the book under discussion today, The Play of Dolls, along with John Water, uh, who holds an M MFA in literary translation and has lived in India while researching Hindi literature as a Fulbright Nehru scholar. His translations have appeared in Plowshare, 
Asian Literary Review and Words Without Borders. He is currently working as a research associate at the Institute of South Asian Studies in Singapore. Welcome, everyone. I now invite Stephanos Stephanides to start uh, inaugurate the discussion today. Stephanos, over to you. Um, um, thank you very much for the introduction and um, thanks very much for inviting me to um, participate in this dialogue. Um, the work of um, Narayan is quite new to me. Um, it goes back to 2019, and I think it was quite fortuitous that John Varta sent me the play of Dolls and said, can you read it and write a blurb? And um, I was delighted when I read the book. It wasn't just a task or a chore. And I was also um, surprised that um, such a great and eminent writer wasn't more well known um, in world literature. Um, and, um, you know, I, I also, uh, more than just um, really liking him, there's writers you like, but you don't, you feel you don't necessarily want to get to know as a person, but I also felt there was a friend talking to me, there was a likeness of sensibilities and minds. And when I realized he passed away in 2017, I just regretted having come to India so many times and not knowing about him to meet him in person. Um, and following his literary journey, I also realized how um, the people he had engaged with was probably the ones that I had engaged with in my youth. So there's so there a kind of kinship there. Um, so there's so much to say there. Um, I really liked, um, I was, the, um, the term embedded cosmopolitanism that was used by Ranjit in the talk earlier, and in fact I had noted down that his is a, perhaps a layered cosmopoetics. I think the idea of, this, of the politics of cosmopolitanism is already embedded in the word cosmopolitan, um, but the idea of cosmopoetics um, rather than the politics really embedded inspires me because it's a sense of a primal force in language that we can only um, aspire to and never really have access to that goes beyond the polity and beyond the borders of any language. And I think this is what fascinates me by the fact that, well, first of all, it's a work of translation, but you also, like Blanchot says, sometimes translation is a sublime literary mode um, because you always have a sense of another text that's come before that you have to imagine what has gone in through this gap. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to turn quickly to perhaps, and we can come back to the idea of deep time and layered cosmopolitanism and the question of cultural memory and the long duration um, back again in the discussion. But um, I received this, I think, in the spring and I took it with me on a retreat. And from the, the very first poem, although I, I went through all of them, but I kept coming back to the first poem because it seemed to um, embody for me his whole um, worldview and poetics. And also, um, we all read words differently. And the word amar am amaranthine, which is quite a rare word in English, but for me as a Greek speaker, it um, resonated immediately because of its root in, in the Greek word mareno marazono, which is a very Kavafian word. And then I realized he had also translated Kavafi into English. But I have no idea how the, in English the word mareno or marazi would have come through. So it seemed to me it was a point of osmosis from his translator um, that these that um, very often a translation takes place on a level of sentience and not always on conscious choice. And it seemed like it's his way of like tying up the whole meaning of the poem. I don't. 
I only read basic Hindi, but I recognize that the title was also the last line. Um, so there was a turn in the translation to make this title into Amaranthine. Um, so uh, let me just read this, I think. And I mean, and I guess just other quick points is also what he says about language before I read it. I think what really struck me was you have a language in which I learned to live, you think. So it feels your words somewhere speak my desires. So the idea of having a language in which you learn to live is also perhaps the task of the poet and the way we will our vernacular into being. So it's, I mean, choosing Hindi, but also being cosmopolitan. It means you're will, he's also willing what the language that he wants to speak in. And that really um, meant a lot to me, those lines, as well as the beginning, um, which, um, sees this truth as a kind of unforgetting. So if I, anyway, let me read it before more time passes. If I am the truth, nothing has been lost. Drifting about, if I return to the places I lived before, I can beget myself anew. Begin from a resolve again, as much right, as much real, as much primal life, that does not perish, a sequence ever renewing, a will that neither yearns nor repents, nor is constrained to only keep passing by people and events. The void that I contemplate covers that same worldly touch, which had liberated the lonely creator of his loneliness and had unleashed a bounty of life on earth. An unfettered now, an uncertain future, that I am, and all I can still be. If I don't let myself break somehow, holding on to others, a dogged courage, a brazen carnival. We have a language in which I learned to live. You think, so it feels, your words somewhere speak my desires. We meet sometimes in the shadow of wars, sometimes in tranquil forests, searching the most sentient codes of amity that are truly universal. We stand on the shimmering truce line of a covenant, sharp like the blade of a saber. How mysterious you touch that I am, still as thirsty after living so much, still as desirous after having so much, still as unaware after knowing all, as unfulfilled after getting things longed for, again and again, and amending even after, each moment ending. So maybe I should leave it at that. I think that I've taken up enough time and then um, we can come back read. to some of these questions yes. together at the end. Stephanos, beautifully read. Thank you. And really your, your concept of uh, cultural memory is something perhaps we might want to come back to if there is time. It's, uh, it's something very vital today to be kept. Yeah. So thanks, thanks a lot, yes. Stephanos. I now invite uh, Shvaikat to. Thanks, uh, thanks Anjali, and thanks Apurvo and uh, the organizers for having me and really putting together this beautiful um, Eve series of events. Um, among everything I saw yesterday, I was thinking of this beautiful um, sort of short film on the effect. Kuan Narayan's work, especially his poetry, had on potters and people who work with different medium. Uh, got me thinking about that famous Ted Hughes poem about poets and potters. And it was really very interesting to see how the craft of poetry actually got translated into different medium, you know, uh, and how it influenced so many writers, so many uh, artists from very different backgrounds. So I will mostly be talking uh, from that perspective. I cannot, I'm also, as Stefan has uh, mentioned, a relatively late reader of Kuan Ryan's work, only have read um, his work in English, though I also read basic Hindi. 
Um, but I'll be speaking, I don't think I can bring the kind of historical knowledge, say for instance, Ranjit brought in his talk, but I'll be speaking more uh, as a, from the perspective of a, of a writer who works in fiction and non-fictional prose, um, someone who also teaches writing and how some of his stories were actually useful to me in his classes from the perspective of craft. That's why the craft evocation was very interesting. Uh, now, when you read, and in this book, um, I really um, loved reading this book uh, for many reasons. One thing that really struck me was that when you read these stories, they come across to you as very allegorical. There's an allegorical nature of the stories. Um, and yet, when we think of allegory, we often think of allegory as a standing for something larger, something bigger, you know, some kind of a human condition. Um, of course, Frederick Gamison has talked about the national allegory and often the argument by the third world, so-called third world writers are always writing national allegories. Can they ever write something personal? And um, so the amazing thing about Narayan's allegories is that they, at, at, they seem allegorical and at the same time, they seem deeply local and personal. And this I find very unusual, you know, um, as uh, Ranjit mentioned, various influences on his writing. And I clearly could see the influence of the European absurdist thinkers. Um, you know, obviously, um, many uh, writer like James Kudzia, also very much a kind of a contemporary, late, uh, later writer, that those strongs. But it also took me back to some writers I know from Bangla. For instance, um, the writer Bonuful, uh, Bolai Chad Mukhopadhyay, uh, the writer uh, Poroshuram, Rajshekhar Boshu, and the sense of irony, the sense of allegory. And um, that was really, really striking. And as someone who's been trained very much in Western literature and did his MFA from America and all that, I'm constantly struck by how Bhasha writers, especially uh, Indian vernacular writers, uh, are challenging the kind of notions of craft. There's a certain narrow attention, a very post-enlightenment, post-romantic technical attention to craft. We grow up with, oh, you must have a certain point of view. You know, the voice is important. And it's quite amazing how these Bhasha writers actually break all these rules and yet produce something really memorable. You know, one thing I often talk about in my classes is that, um, so obviously there's these two entities, the concrete and the abstract. How, without the concrete, a writer cannot create experience, but without the abstract, there's no understanding. So it's almost like using the telescope and the microscope alternating between the two. Um, and what I really, what I find striking is that Narayan's work, it almost seems like the concrete and the ab abstract are used at the same time. You know, there's like this distance. It's really kind of close and at the same time, very distant. I want to just read uh, two paragraphs from a story I have actually used in one of my classes. It's the very first story of this book, um, the story called The Court of Public Opinion. The voice is so remarkable um, and there's so many questions about it. So this is how it starts. Sadiq Mia uh, managed to keep his motives in check at first, but then they went away. A completely new bicycle stood completely unclaimed without even a lock to guard it. He glanced around once, then ran his hand over the bike's glittering handle as if caressing the mane of a magnificent Arabian horse. He couldn't hold back any longer and jumped on the bike. No one objected, nor noticed. And well, what could the poor bike say either? He pushed down on the pedal lightly. The youthful cycle was ready to take off with him right away. The people nearby came and went on as usual, just as before. Sadiq Mia spurred the bicycle on and it began to fly like the wind. It was his now. I mean, the voice is so remarkable, I find, as a writer and a teacher of writing, that there's a sense of um, whose voice is, is the voice kind of judgmental? Is it ironic? Is it intimate? And it's an act of theft that is being described. But the act of theft is described with such charm, with such sweetness. And um, it's really a it's really very interesting, interesting story because one thing you see in many of Narayan's stories are that dialogues are actually quite rare. You know, he talks, and that's also the paradox, that he evokes the intimate. But when you don't have dialogues, that immediately creates a kind of a shadow, that it feels like it's happening behind a curtain. And in this particular story, you know, uh, the dialogues come right at the end. And of course, for those of you who haven't sort of 
um, read the story, it's really interesting that, you know, what happens to the thief and, you know, um, the thief runs into this sort of buffaloes and then the crowd is incredibly sympathetic, like, oh my God, you know, you, you, you are hurt. And there's no sense that he's actually the thief. And ironically, what we see is at the end, the other section, the actual thief, and the person who lost the bike ends up getting a lot of the crowd sympathy. So that's the ironic title, the court of public opinions. And you can see how, you know, irony is not separate from affection. I think that's something I really like that how these stories proceed. Uh, many of the stories don't have dialogues. I mean, there are some stories which are a bit different. Uh, one story is the title story, the play of dolls. Um, it again reminded me very much of actually Rabindranath Thakur's stories, especially the story Tota Kahini, that how, you know, this is a story about this uh, young girl who makes dolls um, and the kind of affection and the kind of um, onslaught on the vulnerability of youth. And, um, and it's really very beautifully done. And, you know, again, reading someone like Narayan, you um, realizing like, like I've also seen reading um, Manto or you know uh, Chuktai, not so much with Bangla writers whom I read uh, in the original, but certainly when these writers come to you in translation, you realize that they kind of give you a curious freedom from the tyranny of craft. That as a writer, you don't have to follow certain rules. You they seem very uh, kind of arbitrary, and yet there's a kind of larger sense of the absurd, which again comes, which, you know, I think that we've been, we've been, we've been hearing about the cosmopolitanism of his writing, and that is very much very there. Uh, I just want to conclude by reading uh, two poems, which I think really come, can, brings out this um, sense really well. One is uh, from this book, Witnesses of Remembering, the poem Groundwork, a beautiful poem. I will read only the English. Another execution yesterday under peculiar circumstances. I went to a hospital. The place was not a hospital. I met a doctor there, but the person was not a doctor. He whispered something to a nurse, but the nurse was not a nurse. Then they went inside, an operating theater, but it was not an operating theater. An anesthetist was already there to etherize, but in fact, even he was someone else. Then a half dead child was brought in, nor ailing, but starving. At the table, the doctor picked up a surgical knife not a surgical knife, but a rusty, ominous dagger. Thrusting it into the child's stomach, he assured, now all will be well. I mean, there's this sense of doom, there's this sense of, you know, kind of disaster, which is both at the same time, you know, kind of classical Greek and existential, which really shows the kind of wide influence. And another poem also I thought uh, was very moving to me, uh, a little late in the world. I reached this world a little late, but then the whole globe had been civilized. All forces had been felled, animals had been slain, the rain had ceased, and the whole earth was simmering like an infernal orb of blaze. On all sides, dense, gigantic jungles of iron and concrete had arisen, and in them could be seen some people preying on other people. In the more modern and evolved of ways, I reached this world a little late. And it's a really fascinating poem. There's this almost philosophical critique of temporality. We've heard, I think, the last couple of days that Narayan was very aware of time, the phenomenon of time. And this becomes a kind of a political critique of modernity. So it's quite amazing that, you know, I think when we look at the micro elements of writing, the close, we sometimes lose track of the bigger one. So I think what really fascinates me about his writing is that even at the mind, at the sentence level, there's a certain carelessness. And I've always told my students, it's only a great writer can afford to write badly. You know, there's this carelessness about being sort of slavery to craft. And yet at a larger level, this embodied cosmopolitanism really comes across. And this opens a lot of possibilities for writers writing today. I think I'll stop there today and, you know, we'll continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Shekhar. That was such an informed and, and really the extracts that you chose to read from, um, you know, also speak about, um, speak about how prescient he was. I mean, if one talks about the court of public opinion, mob mentality, the, the crowd uh, determining uh, judgment of a person or a community or whoever, I mean, it's uh, totally what he wrote 
uh, say 30, 40 years ago that uh, still is relevant for us today. So thank you, Shekhar. I now invite uh, Priya to please uh, dwell on the book. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you, Apurva. And indeed, everyone who's here. Because, I mean, what shall I say? I've been reading these books, and especially the book of poetry, witnesses, not witness, but witnesses of remembrance. And what I can say is that it gives me a calm, it has a calm magic. My days open with a calm magic, thanks to this book. It uh, puts you into a world which is immediately very close to you, and yet seems a bit distant because of um, all that we let ourselves be sucked in. You know, there is this difference. We can pull away, but we don't. And here is this world which is coming back to us, this calm magic that he gives you. And therefore, I thought I will begin with a poem called Poetry. And Apurva, I hope you don't mind if I read extracts. Hmm? Okay. So here is a poem called Poetry. It's a poem in two parts, and I'll read very brief extracts from both. Poetry. It is not a declaration, but a witness. Sometimes before us, sometimes after us, sometimes ahead of us. That's apart from the first part, that's quote from the first part. From the second it begins. It can give us a lot, for so much can be poetry in life if we give it space. As trees give space to flowers, as night gives space to stars. And here again, I mean, you see this collection of uh, images that he's brought in, you know, the human, the other than human, deep time, stars, the fragility, the temporality, which as I also spoke about, the square of the flowers, this wandering is, uh, and this marvelous vast mind, this marvelous vast consciousness is what I'm very grateful for, besides of course the craft, the artistry. And how do we, you know, and here we are trying to reach him, but how do we reach him? if not through his words. It's like, I think, a bit like a river. You cannot place the river except for the landmarks on the banks. And we go time and again to the banks. The geographies of his verses through which we can gauge his mind's reach and the pulse of his heart and indeed the flame of his consciousness. And we drawn into this world, which is very large. But before I go any further, I would uh, I want to thank Apurva for these translations because these are seemingly simple verses. And yet, we know how difficult it is to translate the seemingly simple. I, I, and again, I, it's a water image that comes to mind. I was thinking of this mountain stream, Apurva. Very clear, running, limpid, a lot of life, purity and movement. And yet, all the time, it allows you to see the depths, the textures that are uh, that hold it, the bed that holds it. So there, there's this beautiful quality in your translations, which I deeply admire. Thank you, thank you, Priya. And, and I haven't finished because I was really loving these translations. And also, you know, the way it's laid out on the page and you see how very close if I suggest all of you immediately go and buy the book because you see how close it is. The stanza breaks, the line breaks in the Hindi and the English, how close Apurva has stayed to that and yet brought it to us in a language which we share more than the Hindi. And I know this would have also been difficult because it's a relationship which is distant and undistanced as you have, uh, you know, as is obvious. And that must have re also required a lo lot of courage, a lot of um, pages, a lot of dedication to. 
So thank you for that too. And last of all, from one poet or one translator to the, to the other, I love your use of punctuation. Man, it just blew my mind. Every page is such a delight to read. You get it just right. So with that, I will read a poem, which is one of my favorites, uh, but here again, it's so difficult because this book is full of, shall we say, favorite poems. It is really a magnificent book, but I chose Wild Roses because uh, it has, uh, not only for itself, but also because it has, it says uh, the dedication is after Werner Herzog's When the Green Ants Dream. And we know that Kunwarji was all very involved, not just in poetry, but in the other art cinema. Um, not only was Satyajit Ray his friend, but he saw a lot of cinema. And this film, made in 1984, I think, by Herzog, the German director, is part fiction, part uh, nonfiction, and brings together politics. It brings together cultural history that we've spoken about. It brings together re-memories. It brings together um, various influences. Also, how you speak truth to power, because it's based on this idea, this of the green ant, which is a totemic animal for the First Nation people of Australia, who think that when it dreams, the world is wonderful. But then a Western company, a mining company looking for uranium comes in and they are going to dig up this land, which means there could be disaster. This is what the film is about. And here is Wild Rose. The easy use of metonym here uh, took my breath away. No. We don't want a life of opulent vases. Let us flower and wither our own way. Give us our jungles, our wilds. Do not sever us from our tree, our home. Let us adorn it our way. Beneath it, let us lay our own palette of petals. We want no charity nor cruelty, do not deracinate, nor clip us, or civilize us. Do not try to unravel us, created only from cloud, from, I'm sorry, created only from color and redolence. We are a fragile reverie, weaned on thorns, wild, roses. What a beautiful poem and the way he gets the people in coming there as wild roses. And oddly enough, soon after I read this poem, I saw a film of Herzog's, a more recent documentary uh, called Cave of Forgotten Dreams, which is about cave painting in the early Neolithic age. <clears throat> and there, there was this historian uh, of early art who spoke about a couple of principles which I thought was bang on. One, he spoke about the fluidity of existence of those people in that time. You know, when uh, a tree can speak. And here again in this book, so often we have uh, Narayanji asking a tree the way to a rest house or an, uh, some other than human form life form to guide, help, speak to us. And that I found wonderful. And then again, the idea of permeability, which is what the early art historians spoke about, about communicating between the walls or beyond the walls that divide us, you know, uh, the past and present, temporality and time, and also different life forms. And here again, there is this wonderful line in this book, there is only a curtain between looking inwards and outwards, you know? And this idea of wonder, how far and deep and vast his mind wanders and, and, and the gaze, his gaze, which gets me to this concept, which I'm very fond of, which I believe in, Samadarshan, the level gaze of love, the equity of love, which I find time and again running through this book. In fact, I think it is the bedrock of this book. So with that, I will read 
excerpts from another poem, which is again, <clears throat> well, what shall I say, a favorite, The Estrangement of Bratrahari. Except one, one could still live another life on other terms. By the way, you know that Bratrahari was an emperor who was betrayed by love and he could have killed off his, uh, the people who betrayed him. Instead, he chose to forgive. So one could still live another life on other terms, a little more disconsolate, but far less cruel. I did not destroy them, though I could, he thought, but let them take what they wished and so saved for myself a priceless world of so many possibilities. In camaraderie with nature, without hoarding or squandering, without gain or loss, with just the coming and going of seasons. And second extract, I wish to live that love immensely in eternal time, creating an eternal space, not torn by people and things, not trifling news from kith and kin, standing aside, I wish to watch the world. I wish to laugh alone at myself alone, go on laughing so that tears fill the eyes as if laughing and crying were the same thing, two sides of the same coin, a beautiful face on one side, on the other a forgotten date. Making his sentient, limitless, Bratrahari sees, like a sculptor sees a statue in stone, a poet sees a soul in a statue, a saint sees the universe in a soul, and neither the universe has a limit nor sentience. And may I just end with a very small, a few lines from one other poem. It is an extract from a poem, The Wish of a Leaf. Sitting in a park, I felt at peace. In the comfort of the tree shade, I felt at peace. A leaf fell from the twig. The wish of the leaf. Now let us leave. Contemplating this, I felt at peace. And from myself, reading this book, I feel at peace. Thank you. You're muted. I did because there's a... After your reading, what uh, it really needs is a bit of silence, but <laughs> time will not allow us that. Uh, it was beautiful the way you read and the, and the way you spoke. Thank you so much, Priya. Mm. It is time now to invite myself to speak. So <laughs> here I am. And uh, there's this just too much, too much to be said about the work of Kuwar Narayan, which, um, you know, about uh, what uh, he, uh, his work is deeply intellectual and meaningful and on, on, on the level of it, uh, you know, uh, it is so simple that people might think, oh, this, but, but when you read it again and again, you start understanding more and more nuances of his, um, of his work and uh, uh, new meanings to what he has written. And honestly, these are two books that I will treasure uh, and um, I can't thank Apurva and John enough for, for giving us this treasure. So uh, there are really so many aspects uh, like, like the cuts in a diamond that uh, one cannot uh, touch on them. I will just perhaps mention three things that have affected me uh, while reading both these books. Uh, very quickly, uh, I will go through it. Uh, the, you know, one could talk about allegory, as Shaikat has mentioned, one could talk about uh, the ironic uh, rye uh, deadpan way he, he puts across something which 
in fact, uh, makes it even more, uh, if it heightens the effect of what he has said. But I'll not go into that. Um, I, two things that I would like to touch upon is that um, his work, both in poetry as well as in the fiction, um, is informed by so many influences that he absorbs, takes what is good of it, retains it, and then seeks another influence, whether it is of uh, going backwards to mythology or looking forward to the sort of movements that he's seen both politically, socially, as well as literary movements. He, uh, he uh, reflects them all without falling into any bracket. Uh, but um, uh, what uh, really excites me is that uh, he uh, was born in 27, I think, the late 20s and uh, so he has lived through so many uh, very landmark and historic eras uh, in uh, India as well as in the world and all of that he has um, he has reflected on and they appear in his book say the freedom struggle the new era of hope that India promised then um, the rise of, uh, of uh, bureaucracy with a capital B um, and uh, the emergency period and after uh, and the latest, uh, you know, whatever has been happening. So, uh, and also all the literary movements. So, you know, some people might say, uh, you know, there's an effect of um, existentialism, but no, it is not. It's not, it is not, he does not feel uh, a boredom. He does not think that life is meaningless. In fact, he finds meaning in life. And I feel this stems from say, um, a philosophic um, ontology, uh, a, a theory or concept of being, of existence that reflects in his work where he, he examines what is the nature, what does it mean to be, and what does it mean to be human, uh, you know, and from that stems uh, what, uh, like Apurva has also mentioned in the introduction, something that he wouldn't like to call humanism because it has been given a slant where you have a pyramid where the human being uh, stands uh, right on top and then the animal world and the plant world. And he does not believe in that. It's what Apurva has um, very nicely and succinctly described as humanesque. Um, uh, humanesque, and I would add, there is uh, uh, also humanness and uh, humaneness. So that informs his work everywhere and so, so deeply, you know. Um, and then uh, out of uh, examining what it means uh, to be um, comes his, uh, what one would technically call uh, his epistemological outlook as to what it means to see and to understand, uh, which would mean uh, what, uh, that there is not one point of view, which is the correct point of view. And there are so many ways of seeing a particular and experiencing and drawing conclusions from. And all of this, then his ontology and his epistemology it leads to his ethical stand, uh, which is one which is deeply moral, deeply moral, deeply committed to see the human being not just uh, uh, for himself, but as a part of nature as a part of nature, which, um, which includes not only the animate world, but also the inanimate world, you know? So uh, in that context then, and so I would think also that what I find, and especially in his poetry, a detached engagement. He is, he is removed, uh, uh, observing uh, what is happening, describing it, and it seems like he's not involved in it. And then suddenly you find that he is so deeply invested in the feelings of that person, especially when, when he speaks about 
uh, people or um, or nature, uh, you know, uh, who are not just marginalized. He has deep empathy for uh, yeah. I'm I'm saying not even they are not even on the margins. They are off the page today, <laughs> you know. So his engagement with what that implies, how and why are they totally non-existent to the whole system and the powers that be. And that for me is something uh, very, very crucial that I get from his writing. And that's why when Shaikat spoke I, I, uh, about the uh, you know, justice of the crowd, um, I felt it is totally something that and that would, I think, uh, be the, a mark of good literature that something that has been written and is relevant a hundred years ago is still, uh, uh, you know, relevant to us today. So uh, speaking about, um, about the world which inheres in us and in which we inhere, uh, I would like to, in fact, read uh, one short poem called, uh, you know, talking about uh, even inanimate uh, things have life because they're there. Anyway, this uh, poem is called The Door. Touching the door, it felt it also had a world like our all, a distinct solitude, a distinct life. It wasn't just a part of some wall but also the vista outside, the heart inside. Its past too had the seeds of a tree, the legend of a grand forest, one tied up in servitude today. Even after being so heartlessly hewed and whittled down, on its body stood beautiful the wood grain of his pride. And, and it brings goose flesh uh, on my skin, you know, to read a poem like this. Um, I will not go, uh, there's just too much to talk, so I'll not go more into uh, aspects of his life, but uh, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, <laughs> Apurva and um, John again. Uh, actually, I'd like to have read, um, rally, but uh, I don't think uh, there's time yet. So I'll quickly also read this particular poem, which I feel exemplifies, uh, uh, you know, continuing on what Priya said and exemplifies the brilliant translation that both these, these uh, uh, translators have made. This particular very short poem, uh, it, uh, and you know, especially rhymes, in an original language, say in Hindi, uh, when you want to translate and you manage to do that so effortlessly in English, it is, uh, it is uh, really uh, remarkable. So this particular uh, poem in Hindi is Kahi kuch bhool ho, kahi kuch chuk ho, pul leni leni mein to kabhi bhi is taraf aate jaate apna hisab kar lena saaf galti ko kar dena muaf vishwas banaye rakhna kabhi band nahi honge duniya mein iman ke khate and in english apurva writes if somewhere there be some mistake or even an error in this give and take any time you pass by this way do set your tally right Forgive the oversight, keep trust. The books of good faith will never close in the world. And with that very, very uh, fond hope, I close my presentation and invite uh, John to continue our discussion. John. Thank you so much, Anjali. Um, it's always very difficult to follow after one of those stellar poems. Like you said, you feel like you need to have a couple of moments of silence. Um, I think that the, the title for this discussion uh, to me is very apt, Undistances. 
because on the one hand, it touches on some of the sense of intimacy and interconnection that we see in Kuwerji's work. Um, and also at the same time, it brings all of us together um, as part of uh, Kuwerji's fan club um, to talk about our admiration for him. Um, interestingly, my first encounter with Kuwerji's work was not through his poetry or through his fiction, but it was through his translation. Um, and I had a sort of attachment that Bonnie Precaution and I uh, had come up across the book, uh, Nassim Mayen uh, Dorian, you know, No Limits, No Distances. Um, and I was very struck by the author's thoughts about translation at the very back of the book um, in an interview. And it was through this book that I also first came into contact with um, Apoorva and uh, met the author um, for the very first time and my only time. Um, and I think the experience was maybe somewhat similar uh, to how Apoorva translates uh, his father's poem, uh, Meeting Pablo Neruda, Warsaw, 1955, uh, where there, uh, you know, his face brightened, what do you do, where do you live, um, you know, and then the, the answer follows. Um, so I'll be talking about translation a little bit. Uh, but I think, you know, as Saikot had mentioned, uh, this, is, this is an author um, who's very experimental um, and he breaks a lot of rules and some of the ways in which we think about translation, you know, maybe from a Western or English standpoint um, is not always the most appropriate. And I found it, you know, very useful to look at um, how the author himself thought about his practice. Uh, I think that there were uh, three points um, that he made in this interview I mentioned at the back of the book. Um, which I found very compelling, where he talks about translation at the linguistic level, uh, the cultural level, as well as the personal level, um, in the context of his own translations of the Polish poets, um, Herbert and Rosevich. Uh, in terms of the linguistic area, you know, he talks about the genius of Polish um, and how Polish can do certain things that other languages can't and remarks that actually Polish is perhaps closer to the Hindi language than English. And he commented on some of the, the difficulties um, of getting English to work, you know, according to some of the syntax um, and meanings of words in Hindi. Uh, second, you know, he, he shared something that I think a lot of um, us as translators know, uh, that some texts are um, slightly more untranslatable than others. Um, and he attributes this to, uh, you know, the degree to which it might be uh, culture-centric. Um, and as an example, he mentions uh, Golub. Um, and so, of course, we have many different people who have produced wonderful translations of Golub, and yet there is something uh, which is, you know, unique to the original. And then finally, he touches on something that uh, Stefanos brought out in his opening remarks, um, which is that at a personal level, um, these two Polish poets resonated with his own sense of uh, poetics. So, I'll be talking about the stories. Normally, you know, poems are called that genre that is, you know, the most uh, difficult and hair, hair pulling to translate. Um, but the, the stories were also uh, quite difficult as well, uh, owing to the fact that it was a, a master poet um, who was translating, or who was uh, writing them, um, and not only writing them, but also bending the form uh, to show us something new about the world. And um, I'm sure that you have discussed some of the ontological element, sense of being, um, you know, that animates uh, his work. So uh, what was fascinating to me from the outside um, is his work seemed to be very culturally distinct and unique. And yet, as soon as I was reading it, um, I also felt, you know, a sense of welcome and accessibility. Um, and I think some of this is owing to the surface level, um, you know, seemingly easy and formal prose. Um, but I think uh, to use the metaphor uh, which Priya had shared, you know, kind of like the, the lake, it's also because of everything that is down at the bottom of that rocky bed. Um, and so for me, coming from the outside, uh, I could sense the movement happening beneath the water, but it took <laughs> quite a bit of effort uh, to see, you know, those stones underneath. Um, so there are two, two texts I would like to share and read, which I feel kind of uh, exemplify some of the unique challenges uh, translating these stories and translating Orion. Um, one is the story Fear. Um, and to me, it was a very fascinating story. Uh, and I think this has been... Um, 
touched upon, where he does this remarkable thing where he makes uh, the intangible tangible. Um, and this also overlaps with, I think, what he was discussing for the particular genius of language for Hindi. And I feel like what he's able to achieve in Hindi through that story um, maybe was a bit more, uh, the language was more open uh, to some of the signals um, than English was. And what I mean by that is um, in Hindi, you know, you can do uh, wonderful things like have an adjective and have saw, you know, or see behind it to give it a bit of, you know, efficiency. Or you can have a subjunctive, um, you know, for something that may or may not happen. Uh, some of the, you know, just basic pronouns like waha or, you know, yeah, um, they can be he or she or it. Um, and so there are these wonderful things that Hindi can do, which can touch upon many different, you know, levels. And it's appropriate for the story in which he's trying to uh, zero in on the question of, of fear itself. Um, and for those who are unaware with the story who are watching, it's essentially the story of an author who is sitting at his desk and then this mysterious uh, insect-like, you know, sort of entity crawls into the room um, and in some way takes on, you know, the, the fantastical nature of fear and that it keeps on transforming in proportion to the author's own projection of his imagination. So there's a dialogic aspect involved. And in translating the story, what was very difficult to do was to clearly convey what was going on while choosing verbs and nouns that maintain some of that sense of indeterminacy because it would have been very easy to you know make it overly concrete which would have been and you know antithetical to what the, the story was trying to convey so i'll read one quick passage um, so those who are unfamiliar can get a sense Undoubtedly, it, which refers to this uh, mysterious entity, continued to act so as to agitate me into pouncing on it, and thereby give it a chance to reveal some secret strength it had. It scattered the papers around with such callousness that my mind fired up with unbearable rage. I was trying hard to estimate its true strength, because by now I'd almost accepted that, by viewing it as weaker than myself, I had made a fatal error somewhere. This conclusion had a negative effect on me because for the first time, I sensed how intensely nervous I was. Until now, I believed I was safe from things like it because I stayed far from them. But now I found that keeping my distance from those things held no meaning. It was only if they kept their distance from me that I would be safe. I couldn't pull myself up and rest easy, such that very tiny insects, which could be poisonous, wouldn't reach me through the chinks in my efforts. Nor could I make my defenses so strong that very large insects together wouldn't be able to break them down. How safe I am depended as much on me as on others, especially on the wisdom of others. And if someone refused to understand a person in terms of the person's humanness, then that person's misfortune would be limitless. So you see that there is a degree of abstraction and evaluation going on. And even the term limitlessness, humanness, has a sense of openness and infinity to it, um, which is somewhat unique. Um, and then I'll just close very quickly um, by uh, also touching upon the allegorical aspect, um, which Saikot mentioned, which was also very fascinating to me. Uh, you know, working on these stories, um, you can tell in some of them, such as the story Dubious Moves, that there is an allegory at play and it's trying to convey something. Uh, but for me, who comes from a more Judeo-Christian background, uh, being able to follow the allegory and what the allegory is trying to convey is difficult. And that's made even more difficult by the fact that Narayan is also not limit limiting it, you know, to a single allegorical reading. Um, and so for the story, you know, Dubious Moves, it's essentially about someone who wants to do good in the world and he gets drawn into all the, of the machinations of power um, who want to, you know, help him, you know, but through help them just end up pursuing their own ends. Um, and what was fascinating to me is that suddenly, you know, 
the characters just pop into existence. Some of them are equated with being demons. There suddenly seems to be a sort of cosmological aspect at play. So what begins as somewhat like a noir story where a crook, you know, shows up saying, oh, I can help you with this thing, uh, suddenly takes in the entire universe. And we realize that the debt that we're talking about is also the debt of morality, you know, that we owe to our fellow human beings. Um, and there's a very fascinating character who is a woman in this story. And as the, the chess pieces move through the various stages, she herself transforms in a very interesting way from being someone who at the start is very powerless to being someone who by the end is not only in a powerful worldly position, but even ends up kind of transcending the, the worldly bounds and shackles of um, the world entirely. And so just to close my, my um, part, I'm just going to read uh, from the story Dubious Moves um, during this transformation into that, that something else. Her hair is open, eyes half closed. She's altogether mine. Even then, who knows why, I can't bring myself to be free in front of her. I only remain grateful, that's all. This appearance of her is not dependent on a mirror nor on time. For it is the magnanimous beauty of Atma, free of both, which had ripped open the dense, gnarled folds of darkness to suddenly illumine like the stars. In that moment, she has some singular power with the capacity to bestow infinite love. There are blemishes on her body. I want to wash them away with the dew fallen on roses. But the stains won't go. She kisses my furrowed brow. These blemishes have become a part of this body now. Without changing this body, there's no escaping them. But don't look at them. Look only into my eyes, where there is only you. Only gaiety abounds, where there are no others. And with that, I'll pass on to Apurva. Thank you, John. Apurva. Well um, I don't know. Firstly, I want to just um, tell everyone that uh, John got married just a few days ago. Congratulations, John. This is like a, a celebration of that as well. I, I hope this session. Uh, I don't know if I want to read uh, things and, and talk much at length because there's a, there's a lot of stuff which, uh, which, which I could talk on and I've written most of what I have to in the, in the introduction and the afterwards to these two books. Um, but I want to just respond briefly to to the to the to the poems that uh, all of you read and the stories that all of you read. Um, uh, Stephanos, you began with um, Amaranthine, and I, I uh, think that that poem to me uh, presents a sort of. In fact, what I'm doing, Anjali, now is a sort of um, uh, dissolving this uh, into the discussion itself, so we can kind of move into the discussion from here straight away. Uh, so that, that poem to me uh, speaks of a certain mystery and a, a certain silence and, and a certain uh, subjectivity which is open to multiple interpretations. And that, that particular poem, I think, can be translated in several different ways. Um, and I have chosen a particular way where I've interpreted uh, Utnahi Asamat as Amaranthine, as, as uh, you know, in Ranji's talk, he mentioned the idea of, uh, of um, the will to live which is what I found central to this, um, this poem. Uh, and I, I kind of translated that into um, uh, eternal will to live, which, which runs through the poem. Uh, and this, I would, I would sort of conflate this poem with something like Inner Sight, uh, which was um, one of the last poems that he wrote. And there's a sense of uh, sort of um, gratitude and the sense of mystery and the sense of silence, which pervades uh, both these poems. Uh, uh, Priya talked about uh, poems uh, like um, Invitation, which is one of my favorite poems. Actually, if I, if I do have to read a poem, I'm going to read Invitation because it's really one of my favorite poems from this collection. Um, let me just, it's a small poem and I'll just quickly read it and then I'll get to the point I'm making. Invitation. A yellow shawl of sunlight on his shoulders, standing quietly by the street, a tree that looked like a person, I asked it the way to a rest house. It remained silent, I asked again, and still it remained silent. As I began to move ahead, it felt 
it did say something, after all. Maybe it was I who had not understood the language of one that was gentle like a shade and intimate like a rustle. And I'll just simultaneously read uh, the last two lines from the story Near and Around Shapes. And I want you to just look at the, the parallel between these. But she who beats her head outside in pain, she is only the wind. She won't understand what I'm saying, but I exist because of her. Somewhat so that I will have to understand what she's saying. Rising quietly, I open the shuttered doors and embrace that primal rugged tempest to my breast. So if you, if you look at the, look at what's happening in this poem and in this um, story, uh, and that's, that's how uh, I sort of gave this, uh, I thought of this title on distances for this session, that this whole uh, metaphor of bridging distances is, um, is very much present in both his um, uh, poems and his stories. And here in, in the invitation, we are bridging the distance between us and nature and the all kinds of uh, dualities that this, this author is bridging in his work. And I've mentioned them in the, in the introduction, the life and art duality, life and death, mind and reality, uh, animate, inanimate, which, which you mentioned, uh, I mean, all kinds of dualities. Uh, in this, it's between us and nature, and we're kind of anthropomorphizing the, the tree and making it a person and talking to it. And, and, and there's a certain gentleness about this poem and many of his uh, poems on trees and, 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 and inanimate objects and beings and stones. And if you contrast that to, uh, to a poem like Groundwork, which you read, uh, Shekhar, now that's a very, um, there's a surreal, absurd violence in that poem. And, and you would see the parallel in, in Dubious Moves, which John just read. Uh, Dubious Moves uh, begins uh, uh, like, a, like a, a fantasy, and then it moves like a game of chess, and it ends in, 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 in a violent, absurdly violent, surreal kind of scene. Uh, and I find that same sort of stuff happening in, in, uh, in a poem like Groundwork or Guernica or... Uh, a shop that sells peace, which, which is not violent on the surface, but is very violent uh, in its uh, inner connotations. And I often get the feeling that um, what Narayan is um, doing in the stories is uh, problematizing uh, the very nature of human evolution, of human development. And uh, he's kind of building up these situations um, through various uh, sorts of stories. I mean, stories that are very poetic, like near and around shapes, to stories that are more allegorical, as, as Shekhar said, to, to fable-like stories, fairy tale-like stories, stories that are more witty and, and, and humorous, um, stories that are historical. But he's all the time um, problematizing the whole, whole idea of human evolution and human development, uh, which is sort of ingrained in, in how we make transaction and exchange as the basis for human development. And when he comes to the solutions, I mean, solutions are tentative. He's not going to be uh, giving us definite solutions, and no poet does that. Uh, uh, but uh, the solutions are tentative and paradoxical, but I think he's seeking solutions in his gentler poems. When I read the gentler poems, uh, I read poems on, on, on trees and on, on stones and doors and, and uh, the wind. I, I somehow get the sense that he's trying to, to look for solutions. Now, these solutions are uh, not solutions. They are, they are sort of moral truths. They are, if, if they're scientific truths, they're truths that keep changing the goalposts all the time. And um, uh, so they are tentative in that sense. But he's seeking these solutions and uh, it's, like a, it's like as if he's doing this writing in prose and writing in poetry and then writing essays and writing epic poems and writing literary criticism, all towards building a worldview. It, it, they're all different components of worldview which he's building up and which I which I've alluded to at large both in the afterward to the play of dolls uh, and in, in the introduction to witnesses of remembrance and which is something that I'm writing more on and I'm building up this theme for a for a symposium in Lausanne which is about to happen um, so this is this is one aspect that I wanted to touch on uh, running through this is the is the moral imperative that Anjali spoke of, and this is this huge presence of the ethical and the moral in his work, 
And if you look at, um, again, the same two uh, pieces that I read, Invitation and uh, Near and Around Shapes, there is a moral imperative um, that he's alluding to that we have a responsibility to, to understand those who, who can't speak like us. So whether, whether it's the wind uh, in the story or whether it's a, it's a tree in this poem, he's, he's uh, constantly trying to, to uh, frame the entire conversation around uh, a moral imperative which I find very fascinating uh, in several of the poems, in, in, in this book at least. I mean, his earlier, as I said, his earlier work was very different. Uh, earlier work was um, complex in, in its construction as well. But here the, the simplicity is very, very deceptive. I mean, it's uh, very easy to, to lose the layers in, in, the, in the simplicity of the language. And therefore one has to keep sort of, um, uh, keep track of these, these things that he's doing at a larger level, at the level of a worldview. Uh, in, in wading through these stories and these poems. Um, the other dimension I wanted to touch upon was the idea of time and history and mythology in his work, but I think Ranjit has already um, spoken on that just before us, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to delve too uh, deeply into it. Um, but again, I think what he's doing there is uh, bridging distances. So there's um, some, something to be said about uh, bridging distances in, in Narayan's work, whether it's uh, as I said, uh, the sort of dualities that I mentioned, or in this case, between uh, past and future, between tradition and modernity. Uh, now, if you look at a poem like uh, An Evening in Golconda, and then if you look at a story like uh, The Mughal Sultanate and the Bishti, he's, he's trying to do the same sort of stuff there, that he's bringing a certain past uh, into the present. He's not glorifying the past, he's not glorifying mythology, but what he's doing is bringing it into the present and, and making it relevant. Uh, for, for our time. Then he does it, he moves across time very, very um, sort of uh, easily, uh, I mean, uh, casually even, and, and it kind of uh, destroys our whole uh, notion of time as, as um, past, present, and future. It demolishes that uh, wall down. Um, well, I don't, as I said, I could speak on so many things, but I don't know. I mean, we're running out of time as well. And um, if, if there's anything that you want to talk about, let's do that. Uh, I mean, these are some points that I wanted to make in the context of the title for this whole session and uh, some of the poems and stories that I, that you all spoke on and then I just wanted to react to that. Anjali, how do we move yeah, on? Thank you, thank you, Apurva. Uh, yes, now uh, we open uh, the discussion to everyone here. Before that, I don't think there are questions there have been comments from uh, Terence Mezek, Nabina Das um, uh, about uh, wonderful selection of readings and Terence is congratulating Apurva and John for translating these short stories into English. But um, yeah, now, uh, I mean, we could go one by one or could just jump in with your comments. Um, I think, uh, Stephanos, you wanted to dwell on something that perhaps you had left out. Would you like to speak? Um, I think you have to. Muted. You're muted. Stephanos, you're muted. Uh, or maybe he's. Uh, Am I? Is it okay now? Yes, yes. Back and yes, you did. Yes, you're there, you're there, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I just want to say that um, um, how much um, everyone's comments and readings kind of resonated um, with each other in a way that was really um, meaningful and, um, and gave new, um, new um, points of reflection. Um, and this idea of bridging distance is, has also made me think of um, the question of close and distant readings, which is inevitable in, um, in world literature. We read things closely and at a distance and how both are really necessary. Um, I mean, there's been a debate like no um, world, li um, world literature means you're only reading something that's been mediated from afar and others insist on close reading, but the two are in a sense 
um, not separate. You cannot separate the two. I think we do that all the time as we read. That this idea of bridging is also how we think through the gap. And there's always a way of thinking through the gap, even if you're reading something that's supposedly an original. If you read the original Hindi, it's also a whole context from which this language came out and what's behind it. So you're always um, thinking through the gap and it's multiple possibilities. And, um, and, um, and I think he's very good at making that turn as well in the gap and showing the underbelly. I mean, what really also impressed me was his response, again, back to Kavafi, his response to waiting for the barbarians. Um, and he turns it upside down and says the barbarians have arrived and now what we, do we do? The, so Kavafi's problem was what the barbarians have not arrived and he's saying, well, they're here, now what do we do? So I think he's always on that razor's edge between who we are, who the self is and who the other is. And that's um, and the process of being and becoming and how we do this through language and the limitations of language, that we're using language to go beyond language. Um, and I found this, um, the translations are very aware of this, as it also showed in what they said about commenting themselves and ev everyone's comment. Um, it's, it's, um, it's the dynamic process that is uh, more important than the actual product itself, um, that each, um, um, each moment has an end, but it's also a new beginning. And it's the ceaselessness of being and becoming that um, it's always fluctuating and it's also very different levels and different modes. Um, so anyway, I mean, he's very quickly become, even at this late in life, he's become one of my favorite poets, I have to say, and thank you for uh, bringing him home to us on this, even on this distant Mediterranean island, I very much feel at home uh, um, with his books on my bedside table. Beautiful, beautiful, Stephanos. Thank you, Shekhar. Would you like to add no, something? Just, quickly? Uh, Picking on uh, Stephanos's notion of home and the world, I think what really strikes and which I think came together in so many things we said that, you know, uh, there's a sense of feeling at home and at the same time feeling alienated. I think John also brought it up in the sense that you feel there's something different. And then when you read it, it's and the play of simplicity and deception. I think much of that goes back to something we've all talked about that, you know, Narayan's capacity to assimilate so many influences. And that's really remarkable that, you know, that he's writing, but there's so many influences. I think throughout these two days, we've talked a lot about so many of his influences, both Western and Indian. And that is really striking. And this is, I think, where the translation, I think Apurva and John's translation really um, have achieved something really special. Because I remember when I was, when I first read um, Ramanujan's translation of Anantamukti Samskara, I was like, kind of, sort of like, oh, this doesn't look like a good book. It doesn't feel like. And then I realized that this, my sense of unease with the craft actually is a, is a way of sort of raising a question of the kind of craft I've been trained in. And that is again, a very Western, very post enlightenment, very post romantic, very new critical definition of craft, a very joyce notion of craft. And so when I actually came across Anantamurti and I felt that later with Manto that they really challenge and destabilize this notion of craft. And I think, you know, for a writer, for a novelist who writes in English, but who also obviously comes from India among these traditions, it's a very valuable lesson that in some ways, our Western training kind of alienate us from our, and we find things awkward when anything deviates from it. But the interesting thing is, you know, when reading these stories, I didn't feel that. I felt and this could be had a lot to do with the fact that, you know, we've matured as writers, you know, kind of time goes on. But there was this sense of familiarity. And yet, as you get deep inside, you there's a, there's a sense of unease that you, this is not what you think. And this dialectical quality about Narayan's writing, that it's familiar, but it's alien. It's concrete, but it's abstract. It is close, but it's distant. 
it's allegorical, but it's personal. And that I think is very remarkable. And this is what really, you know, sort of will stay with me. I've, I've seen this quality, as I mentioned in some of Rabindranath Thakur's stories that this allegorical quality, and yet it's very personal. It's not use of dialogues. So I think this is something really remarkable. And I, I, I think it'll stay with, with me and thanks again for John and Apurva for really making the experience so seamless. And I know Apurva wanted to bring us together as people who really haven't experienced him in Hindi. And my experience through him is entirely through these translations. And that that is a really you know powerful impact that it has left on me. So thank you again for that. Thanks, Shekhar. Uh, Priya, John, would you like to conclude uh, or because uh, kind of time is running out, but if you want to have some uh, quick concluding remarks, Priya. You're muted. I think we've all spoken about bridging distances, uh, bridging time, bridging influence, bridging uh, 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 the human and the non-human. And that for me remains very important. And we've also spoken about the moral imperative. And here I think his whole thrust in a way is to get the human to be humane, you know just the adding on of the E, as it were, a shift in the worldview. I think his writing is working towards that. And with that, I shall leave my uh, comments and just express my gratitude for this wonderful evening, this wonderful writer, and your translations, both of you, John and Apurva. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Priya. Uh, John, would you like to quickly conclude, and then we go to Apurva? Yeah, I, I only have um, a few brief points, but I've been, you know, very excited by the conversation. I can tell everybody, um, you know, you're all very deep readers, and you know, very concerned about, you know, both literature as art, um, and also, you know, the technical aspects of the craft. Uh, one of the things that Saikot said kind of excited me quite a bit. Uh, which has to do with um, some of the freshness and unconventionality um, of some of the uh, Bhasha or Indian language writers. Um, and I think this is, you know, one of the things which initially drew me uh, to reading Hindi Ryan and uh, uh, Hindi writing and Narayan's work in particular. Um, I do think that there is a need to kind of smash some of the previous conceptions that we have about genre and what a story can do, because by doing that, we're actually opening up, you know, a mode of conversation around culture, um, which we otherwise maybe couldn't have, or if not culture, what the Porter would call a worldview. Um, and then I think, uh, secondly, for just to go closer to the question of craft, what I found to be very interesting about the way that Narayan opened his stories um, was that, you know, normally in the you know, opening story, who, what, when, where, why, you know, catch attention, get us into the drama. Um, but I found that a lot of Narayan's openings were a little bit slower and often they kind of posed a question or a problem. Um, and so in that sense, um, I think as someone commented, there may be a little bit closer to fables. Um, and then finally, uh, as regards how I kind of uh, feel about, about the work, uh, Aporva brought up, you know, how um, Narayan looks toward, uh, you know, trees and poems like Invitation. Um, as tentative uh, solutions or sort of moral imperatives. Um, and one of the, the kind of enigmatic things to me about this writer is if I again kind of return to this metaphor of a pond or a lake, there is a shimmering surface there. And I think that, you know, he's aware of all of the love and light and beauty in the world. And yet when I translate and read his stories, I'm also deeply aware of a very dark patch of a lake um, that's down there too. And I think he's quite aware also of you know, some of the injustices which are committed in the world. And I think it's this duality that makes him such a profound uh, poet and writer for me. And that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks, John. Actually, the, now we have uh, a question and a deep comment, but really I don't think we can address it because we're completely out of time and Apurva has to, and really maybe uh, Ivan could go to the Facebook wall and reply to those questions there later. Um, I uh, conclude and say a big thank you to everyone uh, for uh, 
really, I am going to watch this uh, recording again to learn from what all of you have said. Thank you so much. And I hand over the screen now to Apurva to sort of, or he has some announcements to make and to conclude this session, Apurva. Thanks, Anjali. Uh, not, not much to say really, except to, to thank all of you. As uh, John very correctly said, uh, they're really, really deep readers. And I, I really appreciate uh, your uh, delving into the work uh, with such patience and, and, and depth. And I, that's, that's what the stories and poems of uh, Narayan demand. Uh, they demand patience and, and, uh, from, from his readers. And I think all of you have done 100% justice to that. Um, so thank you, all of you. I mean, all the panelists, I don't have words to thank you now. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists and, and artists and writers and collaborators and filmmakers uh, from over the last three days who've been so enthusiastically and gracefully uh, participating in this whole, whole uh, series of, of events. Uh, and I'd just like to, to thank all of them. Uh, Finally, uh, you know, this, this session was partly about um, translation as well, and, and I think Stefanos referred to it, you know, the, you're also bridging distances between the original and, and uh, the translation. Here we're doing it from one language to another language, uh, from the Hindi uh, to, to the English. Um, but what, what we'll do now is um, leave you with um, examples of uh, what might be called uh, intersemiotic translation. Uh, we've already seen one example of it yesterday uh, of, of poetry uh, into ceramic artworks. Uh, now from it onwards, we have um, a film which is translating the poem An Evening in Golconda into, into cinema or, or a film, which is also shot on location. So it's a, I would call it a faithful translation uh -huh. of, of the poem. Uh, then uh -huh. we have a very small excerpts from a concert that was held two years ago, a physical concert. Uh, by Shubha Mughal at the Indian International Center. We just sh just showing a 10 minute sort of uh, excerpt from that, but I, I thought it beautifully brings out how how some modern poetry I mean, is not not Kabir and and uh, Tulsi Das that we're singing. Uh, so she has sung those modern poems of Puna Ryan and put them into classical music. And I thought that was a very very interesting experiment, uh, a beautiful musical rendition or. Uh, translation, if you, if you will, of those poems. And uh, finally, we leave you with a, with a, a, a dance adaptation of, of a poem from the earlier collection, No Other World, called River in the Boat by Aditi Mangaldas, uh, which, is, uh, which is also, I thought, a very novel experiment and done in the situation of the pandemic, so, so with uh, limitations of sorts. So just, just to announce that these are the three films that follow uh, the session and we formally close the, the series of events with them. Once again, thank you all for being here and being a part of this. Thanks so much. Thank you, Apurva. Thank you, Apurva. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.